Okay, so now I would like to introduce Seth. Um, Dr. O'Carry is trained in urban and development planning and is currently a visiting assistant professor at the University of Arizona in Kapla. At the U of A, Seth is the emerging faculty fellow engaged in interdisciplinary work on resilient and equitable urbanism in the urban North and South. He is primarily engaged in urban planning programs while extending his base across geography planning and sustainable development solutions. Seth's current research concerns two aspects of everyday urbanism. First, he's involved in an international study of disaster resilience planning in African and Asian cities, exploring the integration of resilience attributes into local development plans and the role of social capital in fostering resilience in vulnerable contexts. Second, Seth is also the project manager of the Unwalkable Cities Project, which brings together an interdisciplinary team of experts from geography, urban transport, and urban planning to explore inequity, inequality in everyday walking in Africa's informal cities. His research centralizes the experience and practices of the urban vulnerable and elevates the role of Southern experiences in shaping the planning and design of sustainable, resilient, and equitable urban futures. So I would like to now turn the presentation over to Seth. Okay, can everyone see that slide on Zoom? Oh, it's not showing up on my screen. <laughs> okay, I don't have this, it's not sharing. Laura, I need us sharing again. You should be able to share. Okay, let's see what happened. Okay, there we go. Okay, can people see that now? Yes, perfect. There you go. You know, I'd asked Adam about that before and I haven't. Oh, you have to do it there. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And then I'm glad that you managed to be here this afternoon. Um, thank you, Gina, for that introduction. Um, Today, I would want to introduce a project that I'm leading um, on Asia and Africa about working cities that are not workable. Um, first of all, I have to say that I'm not an, a, transport plan, a transportation planner, so I don't work on urban transportation as an Ali or Christie will do. So I come to transportation based on my interest in equity and resilience. And I think that's what we all want to do interdisciplinary work that reflects on the lenses of and some of the big questions in urbanism now, equity, resilience, and community agency. So today I would want to introduce something that is very important to me, uh, not from only an academic perspective, but also from a practical perspective, and which is basically um, what I refer to as epistemic justice, how we come to know what we know and whose knowledge counts as knowledge in the discourses of urbanism. Um, before I go on to my presentation, I'm new here, and I think that I would have to introduce the work that I do, and perhaps it crosses the line of some of you, the work that you do, we could have collaborations and think about what we could do together. And so um, here I would want to introduce the work that I've been doing over the past five years since I started working in Japan. So my work concerns three main aspects of urbanism. First is what I refer to as everyday urbanisms. And here I'm interested in the interaction between human and built environments. And in this particular scope, I look at social environmental risk and stresses, community agency, and mobility. And um, the second aspect of my work concerns mainstreaming of sustainable development in development plants. And here I'm interested in the convergence and divergence of some of the big issues in sustainable development in local plants like resilience, circular economy, and climate smartness. 
And the last part of my work concerns planning interventions. And here I'm interested in how planning processes generate exclusion or inclusion um, through outcomes. And here I refer to issues such as quantification, organization, and marginalization planning processes. There are three key words in the way that I do, which is community resilience, social equity, and international development. And I'm happy to say that this kind of framing has taken me to more than 25 communities across four continents doing work with community engagement and working with different um, experts across different disciplines. Today, I want to talk about working, but working from a very different perspective than the way it is framed in the global norm. And so for the, um, for the case of my work today, I want to first start with the universalist framings of working, how working is framed in the theoretical discourses across the urban north and south. And the second, I want to talk about the problematic in terms of this is the French word, but here I want to emphasize um, the idea that the way we frame working in global discourses don't tend to apply in global south context. And third, I want to look at another important aspect of this when it comes to seeing from the captive worker, those who are working, not necessarily because they have the option to work, but because there is no other alternative. How do we reflect on the experiences and the, um, the liberalities of these people in uh, the way we think about equitable transfer? And, and finally, I want to look at what does this mean um, to our discussions on equitable urbanism? What does it mean to policy and practice in the urban South? So first of all, working is presented as having both instrumental and uh, intrinsic value. By instrumental, I mean that working is presented as um, the most equalizing mode of transport and working provides a means to achieve some of the big questions in environmental or sustainable development. So for example, Zatotsky and Ajiman recently have said that working provides an avenue to achieve social equity. In other words, working provides affordable and then available means of transport. So when it comes to working, you don't have to have money or be without money, working is available to also for us who are able bodied. There is another dimension to the framing of working that working also provides economic benefits. Here, the idea is that Traditionalization drives economic activity, generates employment and increases um, revenue generation. There is also the environmental aspect to working, which has been in a book that was published by Crawford with the argument that if we're able to transition in terms of urban mobilities from car-based society to working, there is the, the, the probability that environmental pollution and then the detrimental outcomes of everyday urbanism to environment might be reduced. Here, I want to emphasize that this framing of working pushes across the three dimensions of sustainable development, that working is able to transition human society, whether socially, economically, environmentally, towards sustainable development outcomes, which is, of course, there is evidence to show that this is true. Um, recently, Wood from the University of Birmingham has also pushed across the idea that working is a sustainable option. In terms of the secular economic framings, working could position us in terms of our individual lifestyles, individual decisions that we take, that we could transition to working as a mobility practice if we are interested in contributing to the environment in terms of sustainable pathways. Here we see that this framing of working as embedded in the literature, posits working as something that has to be championed, something that has been pushed across, something that needs to be supported, both in policy and in theoretical dimensions. But I want to offer a different perspective in this reasoning of working, that this um, um, reason of working needs to be problematized. And there are three reasons that I want to push this across. One is the fact that in Southern cities, and I'm referring to global South cities, 50% of all trips are made on foot. So here you have half of all populations working. Um, evidence shows that 81% in Dakar, Senegal, of all um, um, trips are made on foot. In Burkina Faso, 70% of all trips are made on foot. And so here we get a new thinking that there are cities that are working cities. They are working cities because people do work and there's no other better mode of transport. Then there is also this new dimension coming from recent research that even though in certain cities people are working, this practice of working is sort of embedded in our thinking that people work because it's a sustainable choice. 
there is an issue about captive workers. And captive workers are those who are working because they have no choice than to work. And Wood in her recent research in Johannesburg has said that 60% of all households in Johannesburg spend 10% of their income on transport. And this is a heavy economic burden. And so when you are faced with a situation like this, working doesn't become a choice, it becomes an imposition because you have to work to avoid the economic burden. Lastly, um, researchers from Ghana have also shown that besides the argument that a lot of cities in the global south are working cities and people who work are also captive workers, the working environment is precarious and unsafe. And so 40% of all fatalities on roads in Ghana happen to pedestrians. So this is a risky environment. And so here we see another contrary perspective to the global north perspective about working. That in the global south, there is a different dimension to working as a mobility practice. And, and this is the, the, one of the core issues I want to put across. And so in the literature, there is a new emerging thinking called the Southern imperative. And the idea is that if we are going to think about working as a mode of transport or as a mobility practice, we need to decolonize transport. And decolonization means different things for different, different disciplines. But in this particular context, decolonization refers to the idea that the framings, the models, the metrics, of working need to be transitioned and rooted in, in global South experiences. For example, there is a lot of indexing about workability. And recently in Paris, there is a 15 minutes um, um, and working that have been um, kind of pushed by the mayor of Paris. But how do we transition this in the global South? And can we transition this in the global South at all? So the scholarship in this particular um, 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 phase of workability pushes the idea that if you really want to think about working in global South context, there needs to be a decolonization. And one way of decolonization is to rethink the models and the metrics of framing workability. Recently, there has also been the idea that this intrinsic value framing of working needs to be considered quite differently. And the need to highlight the unpleasantness of working, that working cannot always be pleasant. There are some things that working is not a pleasant and transport mode or mobility practice at all. And these has to be rooted in certain conditions, experiences, and practices. And last but not the least is the idea that we need to begin to reimagine the captive worker, not only as a subject of research, but a contributor to knowledge. And this is what I refer to as epistemic pluralisms. The idea that knowledge doesn't come from us going to communities to collect data, but people's lived experiences and their knowledge about their own working practices. And so I want to pick on this last theme and um, to depart from this framing to look at in what way can we make the captive worker a co-producer of knowledge about working? What are some of um, the methodologies that we can adopt to look at working beyond the global north, but most importantly, to see the captive worker as an agent that is able to contribute to our knowledge our framings and our thinking about working. And so I want to present this project that I'm leading with colleagues um, from the University College of London and the University of Environment and Development in Ghana, and then Osaka University in Japan, about this project that is embedded or framed within um, the discourses that I've presented um, earlier on. And so we are now moving to a site in Freetown. Um, Freetown City um, is the capital of Sierra Leone in the western part of Africa. And Moiba is one of the hillside cities um, in, in Freetown. Um, Freetown is a former British colonial city. In fact, during the British administration, it was the capital of British West Africa. So not only is Freetown, but um, a larger chunk of the existing countries in Western Africa. And Moiba is one of the informal settlements in Freetown. In fact, it is the densest informal settlement in the whole city of Freetown. However, Moiba, despite the fact that in terms of its topography is a hilly area, Moiba is unplanned, like most informal settlements, and it's deficient in infrastructure and underserved. It has also a rugged terrain and a poor road network. Actually, in terms of road transport, it is very difficult to get to Moiba. And I remember that before the pandemic, when uh, myself and the other colleagues had to enter um, Moiba. It was a hassle because 
most vehicles didn't want to go to this area because of the transport network. And so we had to walk more than five kilometers to be able to, I mean, I mean, navigate the terrain. And not only this, it is also transport to this area is also expensive, which forces a lot of folks to, to walk because the drivers don't want to ply the road and plying the road means that you have to pay um, really um, 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 high amount of money to go there. And last but not the least, there are not any, uh, there is no any um, um, other transport alternative. So if you're not walking and you have, there is no driver to take you there, then you have no access to the community. And so this background gives us room to think about what I was mentioning earlier. In such contexts where transport alternatives are not available, in such contexts where transport is very expensive, walking becomes an imposition. And so how do we understand walking in a context like this? And so here, I want to push across the idea that one of the ways um, that we could understand the working environment is beyond the metrics and the premise is to look at the lived experiences of the captive worker. And this is very important in terms of the pluralisms of knowledge, how we come to know what we know and how we give the space and recognize the agency of local people to give us um, their lived experiences and information about their everyday working practices. And so to do this, we adopt um, um, a tool that is called Machine. So Machine is a soft GIS tool. What Machine does is that it provides an online platform for making and managing map-based surveys that enable participatory data collection. It doesn't require any expertise at all. Anyone who just who is able to draw a line or make a dot is able to use this tool. And the reason why we use this is that Machine has been used in the past 10 years as a public consultation tool. So it allows citizens from anywhere, any parts of the world to be able to use this tool and to make the opinion head, which has been referred to in the European discourse as social innovation. And I think that it provides an opportunity in contexts like the global South, where data is very hard to come by, the opportunity to get data without the complications and the bureaucracy of going through um, the centralized systems of uh, approval and all that. And finally, because this tool is a map-based survey that is open to all people, it helps us to be able to generate user inputs into the process without we interfering into the processes or going with some metrics or indicators about workability. And for me personally, as a value and as academic orientation, helps to concretize this discourse about justice. Justice not in terms of distribution, but justice in terms of recognition of people's agency to contribute to knowledge. And so the approach that we adopted were two. First, we explored the working environment from people's own perspective. What we did was that we um, got, um, how do you call it, tablets and then phones and we gave to the local people. And this app was on the phone and the tablets. So all that they had to do was every day when, when they were working, they had to just map the route that they were walking and indicate the situation in the working environment that they were working, which required no input from us at all. They were free to indicate the ones that they wanted to show and the ones they didn't want to show. And secondly, we were also interested in, in their feelings, their subjective dimensions of working. As they took this route, what did they experience? Did they feel tired? Did they feel anxious? Were they scared on certain particular routes? This dimension is about not only to get an idea of the working route, but their own perceptions or experiences of taking this walking route. And so basically the way the, the, the process works was this. So they, they take the, the app on any a map on their phone and they, they draw a line, a line from where they start, a line to where they stop. And as they took this route, they were free to indicate conditions. So if they found a tree, they could indicate that they found a tree. If they found a ditch, they could indicate that they found a ditch. But this was open to them as, as, as much as they wanted to do. And then to point out, especially express their own feelings about working as I expressed um, earlier. Now, based on this process, I want to show the interesting results we, we got from allowing people to show us their own experiences of the working environment. And so on, on, on my left and to your right, is the map streets and access path in the neighborhood. The, the streets are the ones in the red and the yellow are, are, are the pathways. A street for us here is a place that is more trouble by car. 
and the pathways are the ones that are no more troubled by car. So they basically it was the one that they had to work. And here I'm being very summative because I've overlaid a lot of the working routes on each other. And what you could see here is the lines that the people draw by themselves. This has no intervention from us about their own working routes in the working environment. And then to my right and to your left is the, 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 the destination, the trips. So we allow them also to show on the maps the purpose of the trips. So they were working, but for what purpose were they working? And here we have an indication of the, um, of the spaces that they were working to. So for children, it was to go to school, and for adults, it was community spaces. But what is also important here in the blue color is what I refer to as the alternative routes. The alternative routes were specific routes that they used if they had to avoid a particular working route. And I'll explain that later, why they had to avoid and why they have to use this um, different route. But from these maps, we were able to have an indication of the people or the participants on working decisions and working strategies in terms of the fact that we were able to understand which route were they using and why were they using this route for school, for community services, or for different purposes. The next I want to show is that we also ask the, the, the respondents to indicate the facilities on the route. The reason why we did this was, even though they give us the purposes for, for their working, we also wanted to know what were the um, possible attractors on this route that were encouraging people to walk on this route. And then here we found that there were community sports spaces, so places that people would gather to play football, soccer, or worship spaces, places that the kids would take either to go to church or to go to the mosque or other community spaces for social gathering or social capital accumulation. However, we also found something interesting about risk in the working environment. And so here, all the red, um, um, the purple ones um, symbolize the risk. I, I didn't um, have pictures to show here because I wanted to keep this um, really short, but we uncovered that because the area was hilly, there were severe risks when it comes to mud flood or flooding because most of these roads were not that. But also, we also found evidence of places that had no street lights. So they had to avoid at night because it posed risk to the everyday working environment. However, there is something interesting I want to talk about which pushes the idea of community agency that I referred to earlier. That even though there were risks in this, in this working environment, the communities have been able to exercise agency by do, um, committing to initiatives that would improve the working experiences. And one I want to talk about here, I think it's very important, is tree planting. So we are talking about an area that has a um, temperature of 42 degrees on average in a year. So it's pretty hot. And then what was happening is that in order to ensure some form of comfort, to my left, all the green spots that you see are planted trees. So local residents, had decided to plant trees to uh, improve comfortability in terms of walking. And what was interesting was that when we decided to compare, which I would show also very soon, where residents were feeling tired and where the trees were planted, we found that every tree was strategically positioned at the place that residents were feeling tired. And this was very important because it showed community awareness about their own working conditions. And then we also asked residents to indicate to us the roles that they felt they have positive feelings or negative feelings to draw the lines by themselves. And all the black lines indicate routes that there were negative feelings. And there were three reasons for the negative feelings. One, when there was no street lights, there was fear of assault, especially on the gender dimension. Second was that um, when it rains because most of the roads were never hard, the place became very difficult to walk. So that was just another negative experience. And three was to use walking routes that didn't have a lot of people using it. So the idea of feeling alone on this walking route also um, created negative um, um, feelings. The green, as you see, the green route, all these were drawn by the local people themselves, were routes that they felt positive feelings. And basically, there were three reasons for this. One, if they took routes that a lot of people were also taking the same route, they felt that there was a chance for 
chance conversations and random social interaction across this route. And secondly, when they found places of shading um, amenities, for example, trees, canopies, and rest stops. Before I move on to the key takeaways, I want to also mention something very um, interesting from here, that when we layer this, um, how do we call it, information that was given by the residents themselves, it helps us to also uncover that even though they had experiences of, of comfort and they also have negative experiences, if we go back to this slide, that shows the um, working, the alternative working route, that is the ones in the blue lines. The question we wanted to understand from this is, why would they avoid certain routes that afforded them comfortability? If they said that these routes were comfortable because they had trees, they were comfortable because they had um, rest stops, why were they um, taking different, I mean, routes on certain, I mean, days? Interestingly, all these blue, um, um, how do we call it, all these blue lines on the map signified situations in the monsoon season when it was not possible to use the walking routes. So what we found was that in spite of all the weather negative or positive feelings, some walking routes were not usable at certain times of the year. And that also speaks to us in terms of um, planning interventions. What do we do with this information? And how do we take this information to improve the, the working environment for local people? Now, I want to stress in um, summarizing this um, presentation, I want to stress three main themes going back to the idea of decolonizing transportation um, and, and modalities. One is the idea that the use of the machine to give space for local people to indicate to us their own working practices and their own conditions help us to understand that uh, um, granularly in terms of working conditions and experiences as um, um, obtained by captive workers. What I refer to as a focus on people. That focusing on people help us to move from built environment indicators to how people experience their working environment. Or in other words, epistemic pluralisms in terms of the idea that getting knowledge not only from us, but also from the local people themselves in terms of their own everyday experiences. Secondly, the idea that even though um, people who are in working cities in, a, in, a, in the sense that they have no option but to work are not disorganized. They are not disorganized in the, in the sense that they understand the conditions of their working environment and they take initiatives like tree planting, rest stops. And this demonstrates collective agency in terms of how um, um, residents um, are able to come together even with limited resources to make occupability minimally comfortable. And lastly, in terms of more of, um, on the planning side is how do we leverage such resident generated data? For example, this idea of all this work and uh, working rather that we have and the collective initiatives as opportunities for co-design, as opportunities to experiment with initiatives that are rooted in certain realities. The idea of workability with people, that people become agents because they know their working environment, also because they have the capacity to act to improve their working conditions. And I want to end with this particular statement that in the broader discourse of opening up these methodologies to gain insight from local people, we may be transitioning towards the avenue where understanding local experience in urban space is critical to the idea of equity in everyday urbanism and how such data can help us to uncover real needs and race and how to work with, together with local residents or vulnerable people to plan and improve urban conditions. Thank you very much. has questions you can type it in the chat box which hopefully you can see <laughs> Does anybody here have a question or I'm like to have that environment hazardous and I don't think we quite figured out how to mitigate that because 
you know, but there's still just a lot of water. There's going to be a lot of um, risk factors. So I was wondering if the group had any ideas on how to kind of uh, mitigate some of that. Um, right. So for those on Zoom, we have an interesting question about um, how um, in, in context, in geographical context where there are environmental risks, I mean, embedded, how does um, the team that I'm working with, um, how do we plan to respond to situations like that, if I got your question right? Right. Um, that's a good question. And I, I didn't talk about the other part of the research that we are doing. And um, because uh, beyond this, we are working with UN Habitat. So last month we had a conversation with UN Habitat on how to leverage this data. And there is a particular group called Work 21, which is um, a, a global agency interested in um, actual interventions in the environment. One of the things we found, especially with Freetown, is that the issue with mass flood and flooding is because there's lack of drainage facilities along the walking routes. This is one pertinent issue. So um, Work 21 has actually picked up on this because Work 21 was already working in other global south cities that has already started doing this intervention in Freetown with support from UN Habitat. And secondly, it was also the paving of um, some of the streets um, for this, which has also been picked up by Work 21 with funding from, UM, from the UN Habitat and World Bank. So there have been interventions that go beyond our academic work onto the practice dimension. But I'm happy to say that because of this result, we could engage the UN Habitat on this to kind of connect with the practitioners to be able to do this. <laughs> yes, please. You mean urban expansion? Yeah. Right. So for those on Zoom, um, there is a question about that. And this is a comparative um, um, uh, question about the difference between some cities in Africa and the US, where um, um, whether um, how urban expansion takes um, um, place in, in Africa or part of the global south. What I would say in simple words is that um, in many parts of the global south, and I speak to Asia, and Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia and Africa, um, urban expansion is basically sprawled. It is not compact. So you have the case where um, um, cities spread outwardly. The situation for Freetown, I want to speak specifically to this context, is that Freetown on the eastern side is a mountain. On the western side is a sea. So there is no space for expansion. So, so it is compact, not by design, but compact by geographical restriction. And so what happens is that you have, um, in, in the downtown areas, you have a lot of the informal, low-income areas settling in. And then in the upfields, you have more of the rich area, uh, richer folks living up there because there is no possibility for urban expansion. Um, but in other African cities, um, urbanization, is more expansive than compact. Yes, please. So my home secondary is not a social practice to walk. It's actually started I had to come back to New York and I was like, I'm walking. You know, so how would we foster like this social change get people out of the mindset of just like the first idea is like kind of drive to you, you know? Um how is we to know kind of like walkability and just like break in that that social system like it's so like ingrained you know, it's hard for me to figure out. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, actually, I, I just finished the work, so this gives me leverage to talk about the recent work that I did on this. So I just finished a work on looking at policy related gaps in everyday working environments. Okay? And we are trying to understand how um, residents view working, how institutions view working, and how policies integrate working. And one of the key aspects of this 
is the idea is that owning a car in the global south is aspirational, okay? It, it is something that you, you want to own a car. This is what you want to do. You don't want to walk. But it is interesting because if you look at the historiography of a lot of African cities, before colonization, they were walking. So this, it is a cultural shift because the cultural shift has been pushed by colonial planning. Because before, and I would say that in 1912 in Accra, there were only five cars on the street and all these cars were owned by colonial secretaries. Everyone was walking. So this shift that has occurred because of this planning designed for automobility implies that it is possible if we would improve the working environment and make it more comfortable for people to begin to shift to other modalities. However, the reason why this cartridge has become so embedded is the idea that there are no transport alternatives and it is very expensive to walk. And so we, be, we could begin to think about the cultural shift when we have put in place walkability in practice. In practice. And I think that this would be, and this is one of the arguments we want to put across that this would be one of the ways to push across the idea of, of making, having this cultural shift. And this also comes back to the question of leapfrogging. Okay, because a lot of global north cities have moved towards the idea that I, I don't know about the US very much, but in Europe, most medieval cities were very walkable. And then you have this transition to automobility and under the discussion going back to walkable cities. Is it possible for global strategy to leapfrog this dimension and to go back? And that's the big question I cannot answer today. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, okay. Someone asked you to share a copy of his presentation. I can, can um, we're going to record this, and this is being recorded, and we'll post it um, and let everybody know where it's posted. Anyway. All right. <laughs> Okay. So, um, for those on Zoom, if I got proposed and question really well, so this is about um, um, how the planning process works in Freetown in, in terms of um in terms of the results. Thank you very much for this. Um, interestingly, um, which I didn't talk about also, is that um, this work engaged the city of Freetown. I, 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 Freetown city was part of this actually. So what happened was that after we finished, this is a very long term project we're still doing, but after we finished, we had to give the results to Freetown city. And what has happened is that um, we were very fortunate because Freetown city has a new mayor, uh, um, that is coming from one of the institutions connected to our project. So they have picked up this idea and they have decided to employ someone specifically on social equity in transport. And so what has happened was that there is a community agency that is taking this map, but Freetown City has um, gotten that this guy who is in charge of social equity in transport, taking this data to see what they will do with it. And that is when they got support from UN Habitat to take this process. What I would like to see, to pick on your question, is that projects like this doesn't become episodic, that it is done and it goes away, but it becomes entrenched in the planning processes. There is someone there who will take this on in the longer term and to scale this up to other areas. And that is what we hope that it will take this on um, following this project. Um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you for sharing. I'm curious about um, the idea of informal um, kind of development, right? And what did you learn about kind of like um, private property and like so are certain walking routes kind of determined because people are putting up fences or putting houses or limiting where you know others can walk? And is there um, I don't know what kind of questions does that bring up in terms of like what's actually private property and Yes, this is 
Um, for those on um, for those on Zoom, so there's another interesting question um, about how um, uh, this is informal settlement. So what about cases where there is informal property? And there is always this question about people blocking off ways and then not allowing walkability around their own houses, like not in my backyard syndrome and all that. Um, I want to say that uh, Moiba is largely informal and it developed informally. So we didn't have cases of this happening because it developed informally. However, um, in downtown Freetown, where you tend to have these mixed and uh, modes of formal, informal side by side, what the question you ask is really present. So what happens is that sometimes you have these spaces in between buildings where people are supposed to walk. But the next day, someone comes to build a wall across it. So there's no, it's not possible for people to walk anymore. And this is also an issue with the way um, formal and informal nexus works in the global south. So even though they, they need permission or they cannot do that according to law, they encroach on these spaces. And so you have cases where um, um, routes become blocked off because of this um, um, property development, um, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, I have, um, 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 how do we call it, pictures on that that unfortunately I didn't show, I didn't show, but it happens. Danny, you wanted to ask it? Like the one would be that they block and they experience the spontaneous parties Or is there like a bit of community knowledge there? No, you go that way if you want to do it. Like, is there like how do people who just try on there? I, I think it comes from lived experience. So um, this is an informal uh, I mean, development. So most of the people there have lived in the area for a very long time. And for Moiba specifically, it, it emerged in the last 15 years. This is when they emerged in the last 15 years. So the working road that they were choosing, they were choosing specifically because of awareness. They are aware that this is the road that I can take at this particular time of the year. And this is the road I cannot take at this particular time of the year. And the reason why I even brought the issue about the trees was the fact that the reason why they were planting trees are, um, I mean, along this specific route was because they were using it. it. Was because they were using it. So it came out of lived experience. Ah, yes, please. Right, that's a good question. And this takes me back to, all uh, right. So um, there's a question about the future of NMT, you no know, motorized transport in Africa um, and for disability. Um, I just also finished the work on non motorized transport policy in Africa. Um, and um, we were trying to review how different cities in Africa were integrating NMT in their policy framing processes. And what I can say is that there appears to be an active turn in transportation planning in Africa. Um, one reason is the international development push to make cities workable. So different international organizations are pushing for um, um, municipal government to integrate this in the planning processes. So I can speak, for example, four cities, Addis Ababa. So there's been a new transport policy in Addis Ababa to put NMT there is a targeted MT policy. The city of Nairobi has um, recently also has um, developed an active transport policy. And then also Freetown, as I'm talking, uh, this is the context also, there's a, um, um, this. In the context of Ghana, there's a central level policy, but there's also the city level policy, right? So there appears to be this 10 towards active transport. The challenge is how this, active transport policies get translated at the local level into more workable cities? This is the big question. And comes back to the work I was referring to at the policy relative gaps and workability dimensions in Africa.
Right. So um, for those on Zoom, this was just a follow up on kind of the way um, the transport and the workability policies are framed, the, the complications and the things that are across their framing in Nairobi City. Um, Ali, please. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I got your question very well because I'm looking at the chat question from yeah. here. <laughs> right, 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 right. I, I agree. I, I agree to that. This is a major, I, I think it relates to, there is a question here. So um, for those on Zoom, um, Ali was um, going back to my initial framings of the, um, the benefits of work in the socioeconomic and the environmental dimension. So um, Ali was talking about how the economic dimension, downsizing it and what it means for um, the captive worker in terms of assessing economic opportunities um, um, in, in the everyday working environment. So a very strong point. Um, there is a question on, on, on online and I want to read this. So. Um, so, okay, so um, there's a question about um, the gender dimensions of the um, of findings of the PAD data. Um, are there um, related transportation solutions to public safety, gender-based violence and all that? So um, beyond adding more street lighting. So there was a gender dimension to walking in Freetown for sure. Because um, as I said, the places that people were not feeling very comfortable, was related to security, of course. And, and this was um, absolutely, there was a gender dimension to this because all the feelings of um, 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 risk and security came from females, especially at night. Uh, and so there was a gender dimension to just respond to this. And for violence, I cannot speak to violence because we did not um, uncover any issue of violence from our study. Um, and then we did not also look at the responses um, from a violence perspective and um, beyond the street lighting. But I will say that this was a pilot study. So it gave us room to think about what we could do towards the future. Thank you very much.